to salute uh, another magnificent achievement by a fellow human being. Militin Velashovic has done it. Accompanied by a sheep, a dog, a cat, and a duck, Velashovic has broken the world's record of 110 days of living in a cave. Now, the old record, as you know, was 107 days, 4 hours, and 28 minutes, which was held by a resident of Lima, Ohio. And... Uh, he has broken that record, and we would like to salute him for that tonight. Of course, that's not much of a record. I've lived in a cave for crying out loud for ten years. You ought to see my pad. Bring it up. <laughs> the following program will have certain hair-raising elements in it that we do not recommend to the faint in heart. We just thought we ought to remind you that you better go skittering on down the diet. You know, they're playing nice mood music down in stereo, too. Oh, you're going with that. I'm just stereo. You poor slob. All right, all set now? All right, I'm going to bow to uh, to uh, an absolute uh, total demand. Hey, why, why are we getting such a hum in here today? Wait a minute, let, me, let me check this little thing here. Terrible hum. Oh, that's the reason. How's it sound now? You don't get a hum in there, do you? Do you get a hum now? Okay, okay, I'm moving this thing around in a magnetic field here. That's very interesting. All right, now, before we do anything else here, I've got to get all my equipment ready. You don't mind if I get everything set here. Uh, gee, there must have been a hell of a decision that guy made, you know, decide to break the uh, cave living record. You know, he could have gone for the high jump. Instead, he decided on that one. That's a tough one. Very tough. I don't know if you've ever lived in a cave. But, uh, you know, the, the uh, down drafts and everything else you get in those caves are kind of bad. Let's see. <laughs> That's a good sound. That is a good sound. Let me try that again. Very good. That's an excellent sound. Uh, excuse me one moment here. I'm checking out on my quip and make sure that it's all working. I'd like to try this sound. Beautiful. 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 You won't get that sound on the John Gambling Show. Tell you that. Although you will get it occasionally on the Jack O'Brien show. Good, good, though. All right, everything's working now. All ready to go in the business here. Now, hold on for a second here while I get uh, this thing straightened out. And you notice how cool I am tonight? A bunch of the boys were hooping it up in the Malamute Saloon. I kind of like to hear that again. You mind if I read the uh, shooting of Dan McGrew tonight? You mind? I'm going to bow to public opinion. And uh, since it's getting on towards winter, and oh, I hate, oh, I hate winter. Boy, I get so mad. You know, I really get bugged with winter. I think the only way you can you can really put up with winter is to fling yourself in the face of it and pretend like you like it, see? And then maybe the winter will get bugged. Because it's not bugging you and will go away. But I don't think so. So uh, let's fling ourselves right into the... Uh, hey, listen, isn't this a great, great... Uh, I think... Would you prefer to hear... I'm going to give you your choice now tonight. Would you prefer to hear the shooting of Dan McGrew or the ballad of Blasphemous Bill? 
That's even better. I don't know why the shooting of Dan McGrew got so popular when the ballad of Blasphemous Bill was even more popular. If you want to hear a, a, a terrible story of, of depravity and uh, a total black humor, I mean, in the, in the most, in the most uh, profound sense of the word, I would suggest you listen as we now follow with, give me a little echo chamber, the ballad, the ballad of, of Blasphemous Bill. Bill. Yeah, I trust you are ready, eh? I took a contract to bury the body of blasphemous Bill Mackay. How's that for an opening line in a poem? He doesn't say why. <laughs> there it is. It gets right down to the guts of it right away. I took a contract to bury the body of blasphemous Bill Mackay. Now, you notice he doesn't tell you why he was called Blasphemous Bill Mackay. Just Blasphemous Bill. Whenever, wherever, or whatsoever the manner of death he die, whether he die in the light of day or under the peak-faced moon, in a cabin or dance hall, camp or dive, mucklucks or patent shoon. You know what patent shoon means? That's a 19th century word meaning patent leather shiny shoes. Whether he dies wearing mucklucks or Eskimo boots, or whether he dies wearing beautiful patent leather shoes on velvet tundra or virgin peak, whether he dies by glacier, drift or draw, in muskeg hollow or canyon gloom, by avalanche, fang or claw, by battle, murder, or sudden death, or sudden wealth, by pestilence, hooch, or lead. I swore on the book I would follow and look until I found my tombless dead. You see, friends, Bill was a dainty kind of cuss, and his mind was mighty sopped on a dinky patch with flowers and grass and a civilized boneyard lot. And where he died, or how he died, it didn't matter a damn. As long as he had a grave with frills and a tombstone epigram. So I promised him. And he paid the price in good Chicheco coin. Which the same I blowed in that very night down in the tenderloin. And then I painted a three-foot slab of pine. Reading to wit. Here lies poor Bill Mackay. And I hung it up in my cabin wall, and I sat back and waited for Bill to die. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Well, you know how it is. You reset that, because I'm going to use that later. Years passed by, and at last one day came a squaw with a strange story of a long, deserted line of traps way back of the Bighorn Range of a little hut by the Great Divide, and a white man, stiff and still, lying there by his lonesome self. And I figured it must be Bill. So I thought of the contract I'd made with him, and I took down from the shelf the swell black box with the silver plate that he picked out for himself. And I packed it full of grubs and hooch and slung it on the sleigh. Then I harnessed up my team of dogs, and I was off at the dawn of day. Friends, do you know what it's like in the Yukon wild when it is 69 below? When the ice worms wriggle their purple heads through the crust of the pale blue snow? When the pine trees crack like little guns in the silence of the wood? And the icicles hang down like tusks under your parka hood? When the stovepipe smoke, the smoke breaks off. And the sky is weirdly lit. And the careless feel of a bit of steel burns like a red-hot spit when the mercury is a frozen ball and the frost fiend stalks to kill. Well, it was just like that the day that I set out to look for Bill. Oh, the awful hush that seemed to crush me down on every hand as I blundered, blind, with a trail to find through that blank and bitter land. 
half-dazed, half-crazed in the winter wild with its grim, heartbreaking woes and the ruthless strife for a grip on life that only the sourdough knows. North by the compass, north, I pressed. North, river and plain, and peak passed like a dream that I slept to lose, and I woke to dream again. River and plain, a mighty peak. And who could stand unawed as their summits blazed? He could stand undazed at the foot of God, north, yeah, north, through a land accursed, shunned by even the scouring brutes. And all I heard was my own harsh word and the whine of the Malamutes. Until suddenly, at last, I came to a cabin, squat, built in the side of a hill. And I burst in the door, and there on the floor, frozen to death, lay Bill. Ice, white ice, like a winding sheet, sheathing each smoke-grimed wall. Ice on the stovepipe, ice on the bed, ice gleaming over all. Sparkling ice on the dead man's chest, and yeah, glittering ice in his hair, ice on his fingers, ice in his heart, ice in his glassy stare, hard as a log, and trussed like a frog with his arms and legs outspread. I gazed at the coffin I'd brought for him, and I gazed at the gruesome dead, and at last in that icy cabin I spoke. <laughs> Bill liked his joke, but still, gall darn his eyes, a man ought to consider his mates and the way he goes and dies. Have you ever stood in an Arctic hut in the shadow of the pole with a little coffin, six feet by three, and a grief you couldn't control? Have you ever sat by a frozen corpse that looks at you with a grin and that seems to say over and over, Dad, you may try all day, but you're never going to jam me in. Well... I'm not a man of the quitting kind, and I never felt so blue as I sat there gazing at that stiff and studying what I'd do. Then I rose and I kicked off the husky dogs who were nosing round about, and I lit a roaring fire in the stove, and I started to thaw Bill out. Well, I thawed, and I thawed, and I thawed for thirteen days. But it didn't seem no good. His arms and his legs stuck out like pegs, as if they was made of wood. Until at last I said, Well, it ain't no use. He's froze too hard to thaw. He's obstinate. They won't lie straight. So I guess I... Yeah, I guess I got to saw. So I sawed off poor old Bill's arms and legs, and I laid him snug and straight in that little cabin he picked himself with the dinky silver plate. And you know, I come nigh near to shedding a tear as I nailed him safely down. Then I stowed him away in my Yukon sleigh, and I, well, I started back to town. So I buried him as the contract was, in the narrow grave and deep. And there he's waiting the great cleanup when the judgment's lease head sweep. And I smoke my pipe, and I kind of meditate. In the light of the midnight sun. And sometimes, you know, I wonder if there really was the awful things I'd done. And I, and as I sit, and as the old parson talks, expounding of the good law, I often think of poor old Bill. And I think how hard he was to saw. You've got to admit, that's a lot better than the, than the shooting of dangerous Dan McGrew. It has strange ecclesiastical overtones. You know, there's something sneaking up on you. Let's see. Oh, yeah. Hey, listen. Do you have that, do you have that camp, that total camp record? All set? Ah, uh, you, you cue it up in there. I thought you had it queued up. All right, get, get ready in there now. Um, get ready now. Can you imagine? Can you imagine setting this scene up now? I'm all set now. Got it in there? Tell me when you're ready. Okay, now hold it there for a second now. Okay? 
Now, now, you being the ultimate cool, of course, totally controlled, and uh, deeply concerned with modern sounds, of course, modern thoughts, modern ideas. I mean, you have seen every Swedish movie they have ever made, man. I mean, you are even dreaming up your own Swedish movies at night when you're all by yourself. You know, fantastic second reels, unbelievable. By the way, did you read about the pornography fair in Denmark? Did you read about that? Yeah, they got a pornography fair in Denmark, just like any other trade fair, you know. <laughs> I'll tell you, one day this whole world is going to disappear. A giant lightning bolt's going to come down and zap. <laughs> All right, now, now, wait just a minute. I'm looking up something here. Yeah. Yeah, here we go. One, two, three, four. You know, they don't really tell here. That's right. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, okay. All set now. All right, now I want you to listen to this. If you, if you want to hear the, the sound of, of ultimate camp, ultimate camp, can you imagine? You're, you're showing, you see, you're showing uh, your little 16-millimeter print of Andy Warhol's most controversial art film. You got it? And it's, uh, you know, they're all there and everybody, everybody's sitting around. And the pot smoke is drifting. And then you say, how my little mood music, friends? And that they expect the stone, see. You reach back and you touch the button on your stereo. <laughs> and of course, the first thing was, what, what, you, have you, have you blown your, you flipped your wig? What's the matter, Charlie? What's that? Oh. You said, it's the newest group. Look it up. <laughs> Now, I don't know whether or not I ought to do the, uh, tonight. You know, it's funny. You, you get in the mood for, for, uh, for, uh, Robert's service at this time of the year when the fall is coming. I really do. I don't know whether I ought to do the cremation of Sam McGee. Which would you prefer? The cremation of Sam McGee. Now, I'll give you your choice in the control room there. The shooting of Dan McGrew. Now, wait. I'm not through yet. I'll, I'll tell you what I've got for you to choose from. I've got them all here, but these these make great readings. You know, I'd love to do, uh, I, if there's anybody out there listening who has anything to do with a record company, I would like to do a an LP of classical Robert Service, the way it should be done. Boy, don't get one of these cornball actors to read. This is terrible. <laughs> There are so many bad recordings around of, of uh, Robert Service that it makes you sick to think about it. But uh, let's see. I've got, uh, listen to some of these great ones I can give you if you want. The Ballad of the Blasphemous Bill. You just heard that. Here's a groovy one. The Ballad of the Black Fox Skin. That's a sneaky one. Oh, it, that's got the greatest first line I've ever heard in a poem. Do you want to hear the, the first line of this one? Listen to the ballad of the uh, black fox skin. The opening line is fantastic. He really knew how to write an opening line. And I tell you, this is a writer. This guy, uh, listen to this one. The opening line of the ballad of the black fox skin. There was claw-fingered kitty. <laughs> I'll hold you right there. <laughs> he just said three, three words. He's already got you. Listen. There was claw-fingered Kitty and Windy Ike living the life of shame when unto them in the long, long night came the man who had no name bearing his prize of a black fox pelt. Out of the wild he came. His cheeks were blanched as the flume-head foam when the brown spring freshets flow. Deep in their dark, thin calcined pits were his somber eyes aglow. And listen to this name. Listen to this line. They knew him far for the fitful man who spat forth blood on the snow. Oh, now there's a guy for you to handle. The fitful man. I like that phrase, the fitful man who spat forth blood on the snow. And listen to his eyes deep in their dark, thin calcined pits where his somber eyes aglow. Yeah, 
and they knew him far for the fitful man who spat forth blood on the snow. Did you ever see such a skin? Quoth he, eh, there's naught in the world so fine, such fullness of fur as black as the night, such luster, such size, such shine. Yeah, it's life to a wung lunged man like me. It's London, it's women, it's wine. The moose hides, the Injuns call it the devil fox, and swore that no man could kill, that he who hunted it sooner or later must suffer some ill. But I laughed at them with their old squaw tails, <laughs> and I'm laughing still. For look ye, the skin, it's as smooth as sin and black as the core of the pit. By gun or by trap, Whatever the hap, I swore I'd capture it by star. And by star afield and afar I hunted, and I would not quit. For the devil fox, it was swift and sly, and it seemed to flee at me. I would wake in fright by the campfire light, hearing its evil glee. That evil devil fox, into my dream, its eyes would gleam, and its shadow would I see. It sniffed, and it ran from the bait that I had poisoned to excess. Unharmed, it sped from my wrathful head. It was as if I shot by guess. I couldn't hit it. Yet it came by night, in the stark moonlight, to mock at my weariness. I tracked it up where the mountains hunched like the vertebrae of the world. I tracked it down to the death-still pits where the avalanches hurled. From the glooms to the ancient snows where the carded clouds are hurled. From the vastitudes where the world protrudes through clouds like seas up shoaled. Yeah, I held its track until it led me back to the land that I had left of old. The land that I had looted many moons. I was weary and sick and cold. I was sick, soul sick of the futile chase of that evil devil fox. And there and then I swore the foul fiend fox I'd let go. I would hunt him no more. And then I rubbed my eyes in a surprise. It stood there by the cabin door, a rifle raised in the gloom and a vengeful shot that sped, a howl that would thrill a cream-faced corpse, and the demon fox lay dead. Dead. Yet there was never a sign of a wound. And never a drop of blood he bled. So that was the end of the great black fox. And here is the prize that I've won. The beautiful skin. And now for a drink. How about a drink to cheer me up? I've mushed since the early sun. We'll drink a toast to the sorry ghost of the fox whose race is won. That's okay. That wasn't the one. <laughs> That's all right. Nice guess. We'll drink a toast to the sorry ghost of the fox whose race is won. You want to hear the rest of that? What evil happens with this fox skin? Listen to this now. You ain't seen nothing. Yeah. Now, claw-fingered Kitty and Windy Ike, bad as the worst they were. In their house by the river trail, they waited and watched for prey. <laughs> and what a pair. They waited and watched for prey. With wine and song, they joyed all night long, and they slept like swine all day. For things were done in the midnight sun that no tongue will ever tell, and men there be who walk earth free, but whose names are writ right now in big letters in hell. Writ in flames, the guilty names, Fournier, La Belle, the evil one. Uh, put not your trust in a poke of dust, a poke of gold dust, would ye sleep the sleep of sin, for there be those who would rob your clothes ere the dawn comes in. And a prize likewise in a woman's eyes is a peerless black fox skin. Better you would to put your faith in the mountain cat if you lie within his lair. Trust the fangs of the mother wolf and the lead-ripped bear, the clay.
claws of the worst evil bear you can find. Friends, trust those, but beware of the wiles and the gold tooth smiles of a dance hall wench. Beware. Wherefore, it was beyond all laws that lusts of man restrained. A man drank deep and sank to sleep never to wake again. Wendy Ike, claw-fingered kid, had put the man who spits blood on the snow to sleep forever. You don't want to hear the rest of this. It gets it gets worse as it goes on. You want to hear what happened to, 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 to claw-fingered kitty? Nah. <laughs> you do. Well, I want to tell you. You want to hear this? All right, all right. Sneak it in there. Okay. You want to hear what happened now? These two evil, sin-soaked wretches who slept like swine all day and drank and yelled and hollered all night. Now they own the black fox skin. Yes, the black fox skin cast a shadow from the roof nigh to the floor. Sleek and soft it gleamed. And claw-fingered kitty stroked it. And the man swore, stood by with a brooding eye, and gnashed his teeth. And swore, when thieves and thugs fall out and fight, oh, somebody's going to pay. And sooner or later, Sin meets his fate, and so it fell one day that claw-fingered Kitty and Wendy Ike fanged up like dogs at bay. The skin is mine, all mine, she cried. I did the deed, alone, I killed him. It's share and share alike, with a guilt yoke pair, he hissed in a pregnant tone. It's share alike. And so they snarled like malamutes over a mildewed bone. And so they fought, and they fought, with no fear, until happily it befell one dawn of day she slipped away to Dawson Town to sell the fruit of sin, this black fox skin that had made their lives a hell. She slipped away as still Windy Ike lay. She clutched the wondrous fur. Her pulses beat, her foot was fleet, her fear was as a spur. She laughed with glee, but she did not see him rise and follow her. The bluffs uprear and grimly peer far out over Dawson Town. They see its lights ablaze at nights, and harshly they look down those peaks. They mock the plan and plot of man with grim, ironic frown. Well, the trail was steep. It was at the time when swiftly sinks the snow, all honeycombed. The river ice was rotting down below. The river chafed beneath its rind with many a mighty throw. The spring was on its way. And up the swift and oozy drift, a woman climbed in fear, clutched to her a black fox spur as should she held the deer's life. And hard she pressed it to her breast. And then Windy Ike drew near. She made no moan. Her heart was stone. She read his smiling face, and like a dream flashed all of her life's dark horror and disgrace. A moment only, and with a snarl, he hurled her far out into space. She rolled for nigh onto a hundred feet. She bounded like a ball from crag to crag. She carried him down through snow and timber fall. A hole gaped by the river ice. The spray flashed in the sun. That was all. A bird sang for joy of spring, so piercing, sweet, and frail. And blinding bright, the land was in gay and glittering mail. The beautiful sun, with a wondrous black fox skin, a man. Windy Ike slid down the trail, a wedged-faced man there was who ran along the river bank, who stumbled through each drift and slough, and ever slipped and sank and cursed his maker's name and drank hooch as he ran. Uh, he traveled like a hunted thing, hard, harried, sore, distressed. 
That old grandfather moon crept out from her cloud-quilted nest. The aged mountains mocked at him with their primeval rest. <laughs> Grim shadows moved across the snow. And the air was strangely mild. The valley's width was dumb with mirth. The laughter of the wild. <laughs> the sardonic laughter of an ogre about to eat a child. The river writhed beneath the ice. It groaned like one in pain. And yawning chasms opened wide and closed and yawned again. And sheets of silver heaved on high until they split in twain. From out the roadhouse by the trail, they saw a man make for the narrow river reach where the swift cross currents are, where frail and worn the ice is torn and the angry waters jar. But they did not see him crash and sink into the icy flow. They did not see him clinging there, gripping, gripped, and torn by the undertow, clawing with bleeding fingernails at the jagged ice and snow. They found a note beside the hole where the man had stumbled in. Here met his fate by evil luck, a man who lived in sin, it read. And to the one who loves me least, I leave this black fox skin. I leave this black fox skin, a strangely writ note, in a strange hand. And strange it is, though they searched the river all around. No trace, no sign of black fox skin was ever after found. Though one man said that he saw the tread of hoofs deep in the ground. <laughs> now, how do you like that for existential poetry? Yeah. Living the life of sin. Wendy Ike. Claw-fingered kitty. <laughs> I like claw-fingered kitty. <laughs> you want to hear another great opening line? Listen to this one. Uh... His opening lines, uh, you know, it's funny when you write, uh, and I can tell you this as a writer, you know, it's, it's a, it's a, it's important, uh, that, that, uh, that you have to, it's not so much grab their attention, but you have to create a whole mystique with one or two sentences. Many a writer has failed because he couldn't do this. Listen to this now. Listen to this. Here's, a, here's one of the most famous opening lines of all time. There are strange things done in the midnight sun by the men who moil for gold. How do you like that? The men who moil for gold. The Arctic trails have their secret tales that would make your blood run cold. Now you try to top that one. Now... I'll read the most famous line, probably, this side of Melville. Of course, Melville's great line, call me Ishmael. How's that for an opening line? <laughs> Just call me. He doesn't say he is Ishmael, you know. Call me Ishmael. Just drops it. Well, now I'll read probably the most famous of all of them. Just hang in there. As soon as I find it here. Great opening line. Yeah, here it is. This line stands with one of the, absolutely one of the great opening lines in all of the English language. A bunch of the boys were hooping it up in the Malamute Salon. The kid that handles the music box was hitting a jag time to him. Back of the bar in a solo game sat dangerous Dan McGrew. And watching his luck was his light of love, the lady that's known as Lou. When, out of the night, which was fifty below, and into the din and the glare, there stumbled a miner, fresh from the creeks, dog dirty, and loaded for bear. 
<laughs> I like that. Loaded for bear. He looked like a man with a foot in the grave and scarcely the strength of a louse. Yet he tilted a poke of dust on the bar and he called for drinks for the house. And there was none who could place the stranger's face, although we searched ourselves for a clue. But we drank his health, and the last to drink were dangerous Dan McGrew. You know, there's men that somehow just grip your eyes and hold them hard like a spell. Such was he, and he looked to me like a man who had lived in hell, with a face almost all hair and the dreary stare of a dog whose day is done. As he watered the green stuff in his glass, the drops fell one by one. Then I got to figuring who he was and wondering what he'd do. And I turned my head, and there watching him was the lady what's known as Lou. His eyes went rubbering around the room, and he seemed in a kind of daze, and until at last that old piano fell in the way of his wandering gaze. The ragtime kid was out having a drink, and there was no one else on the stool. So the stranger stumbles across the room and flops down, flops down there like a fool, in a buckskin shirt that was glazed with dirt, he sat, and I saw him sway. Then he clutched the keys with his talon hands. My God, but could that man play? Were you ever out in the great alone when the moon was awful, clear, and the icy mountains hemmed you in with a silence you could almost hear? with only the howl of a timber wolf, and you camped there in the cold, a half-dead thing in a stark dead world, clean mad for the muck called gold, while high overhead, green, yellow, and red, the northern lights swept in bars. Well, then you've got an idea of what that music meant, hunger at night and the stars. And hunger not of the belly kind that's banished with bacon and beans, but a gnawing hunger of lonely men for home and all that it means. Then... All of a sudden, the music changed, so soft you could scarce hear. But you felt that your life had been looted clean of all that it once held dear, that someone had stolen the woman you loved, that her love was a devil's lie, that your guts were gone, and the best for you to do was to crawl away and die. It was the crowning cry of a heart's despair, and it thrilled you through and through. I guess I'll make it a spread, Miss Eyre, said dangerous Dan McGrew. The music almost died away, and then it burst like a pent-up flood, and it seemed to say, repay, repay, and my eyes were blind with blood. The thought came back of an ancient wrong, and it stung like a frozen lash, and the lust awoke to kill, kill. Then the music stopped with a crash, and the stranger turned, and his eyes were burned in a most peculiar way. In a buckskin shirt that was glazed with dirty sap, I saw him sway. Then his lips went in a kind of grin, and he spoke, and his voice was calm. Boy, said he, you don't know me. None of you care a damn. But I want to state, and my words are straight, I'll bet my poke they're true, that one of you is a hound of hell. And that one is Dan McGrew. Then I ducked my head, and the lights went out, and two guns blazed in the dark. And a woman screamed, and the lights went up. And two men lay, stiff and stark, pitched on his head and pumped full of lead, was dangerous Dan McGrew. While the man from the creeks lay, clutched to the breast of the lady that's known as Lou. Well, those are the simple facts of the case, and I guess I ought to know. They say that the stranger was crazed with hooch, and I'm not denying that it's so. You know, I'm not so wise as the lawyer guys, but strictly between us two. The lady that kissed him and then pinched his poke was the lady that's known as Lou. All right, you go mucking around for gold. You go moiling for gold, friend, and you're liable to run into a lady that's known as Lou. Yeah, I can just see you sitting down there in that cabana in Miami Beach next to a lady what's known as Lou. But the evil eye. <laughs> Very good. Very good. You enjoyed that, didn't you? <laughs> I'll tell you. I'll tell you, he you know, you know, I, I say that the secret of, of Robert's service 
is that he deals with probably the oldest of all of man's driven, hunted urges. The oldest of them all, greed. Running through all of his poems are greed. Yes. And don't you think that doesn't run through life? Greed. In fact, uh, uh, you know, uh, for those of you who think that sex is the only sin, uh, we have here a little booklet called The Seven Deadly Sins and How to Get More Out of Them. Have you tried greed, friends? That's the grooviest one of all. Because <laughs> you can practice greed all of your life. You can practice in any place, any time, any climb. Yes. And even get applauded for it. So, uh, send your name and address. You must be over 21. Send your name and address to sin in care of the station. And as a public service, we'll send you our little illustrated booklet on how to get more out of the sin that you do have. No sense in just fooling around and doing it halfway. And if you're one of the first 20 to send in, and you are over 21 and a qualified art student, we'll send you something we've been working on in our laboratory here. Yes, we've finally come up with it, and we think we've got it perfected. The ultimate eighth sin. Be the first in your neighborhood to try it. Don't wait. Be the first. Get in before it's made illegal. 